speech. Now I look to the Right Honourable Lord Hoffman to continue the case for proposition. Mr. President, uh, may I first say how delighted I am to have been asked uh, to speak in this debate for the first time in this chamber. Uh, it, this term is actually 67 years since I first entered the chamber and saw your predecessor, Mr. Michael Heseltine of Pembroke College, <laughs> sitting, uh, as it seemed to me, like a blonde god in your chair. <laughs> But I never did I take the opportunity to stand up and say anything. <laughs> and tonight is the first time that I'm doing so. Now, the first question that you have to ask in considering the motion is, what kind of society are we talking about? Is it a state which is a functioning democracy? Or is it one in which reforms, even if they're supported by the majority of the people, have no hope of becoming law. If it is a functioning democracy, then I put it to you that the case for the motion is overwhelming. If it is not, you may be justified in voting for such a motion on the grounds that, for want of anything better, the judges are the only arm of government who are in a position to reform the law. Now, I assume this debate is about our country, the United Kingdom, and it is, for all its uh, uh, faults and anomalies, a functioning democracy, which, uh, as Mr. Churchill memorably said, is the worst form of government apart from all the others which have been tried. <laughs> now, the question of social justice is always one of political controversy. Some people are for it, and some people are against it, and our system deals with that by negotiation and compromise, and in the end, by a majority in parliament. And on the whole, it works. I mean, consider how we in this country have dealt with the great social issues which have troubled the courts of the United States over the past 50 years or so. If you take, for example, uh, sex discrimination, race discrimination, these have been the subject of legislation here since 1965. And going back to the issues that have troubled the Americans, capital punishment, <laughs> capital punishment in this country was abolished by parliament in 1965. The trouble they have with the powers of their police, we have had a Police and Criminal Evidence Act since 1984. So let's contrast that with what the position is with them. They are not at the moment a functioning democracy. It's virtually impossible to pass any legislation dealing with controversial social issues, even if it has the support of the majority of the people. I mean, to take the most prominent example, which my learned leader uh, touched upon, abortion. The United States, it's a federation. Every uh, state has its own laws. And until 1973, they were entitled to prohibit abortion, and most of them did as indeed did this country until 1967. But a majority of the American people have will then of the opinion and have since consistently agreed that women should have a right to abortion. And yet there's nothing to be done about it from a legislative point of view. It would require a constitutional amendment and there's no way in which that can be done. The only way in which it could be done was by the judges in 1973, in the Roe and Wade case, producing, like a rabbit out of a hat, a constitutional right to have an abortion. Now, the, the result of, the, result of, the, of the, 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 the Roe and Wade case was an achievement of social justice, but a precarious one. Because apart from achieving the right result, the, resu the, the reasoning in that case was very unconvincing. And a court which doesn't share its social views may reverse it. And the result has also been achieved at very great cost. And the first is it's politicized the Supreme Court. Uh, because passions about abortion run so high, no one seems to be concerned in America 
about whether a candidate for a vacancy on the court is a good lawyer or not. Both those who are for him and those who are against him. What they're concerned about is what his views are on abortion. And that usually coincides with his political, political alignment. So they are cringe-making interviews on television with, where candidates are asked how they behaved at drunken parties at, when they were at college 30 years earlier. Uh, anything which could prevent the appointment of somebody who has the wrong views. And everybody knows the, story, the lives of all the nine justices. They tend to be appointed when they're young so that their views will be on the court for many, many years, even if public opinion has changed. The justices of the Supreme Court are there for life. Now, contrast that with the position in this country, the Supreme Court, and before that, the House of Lords. I mean, apart from law students and a minority of lawyers, no one's heard of us. I doubt, <laughs> I, doubt when, I doubt there are many people who could tell you the name of a single member of the Supreme Court. We're, we're, we're appointed by what is in practice a, a form of, of co-option. And uh, as for politics, I mean, I, let alone the public, didn't know the political views of my colleagues. Brenda Hale recently achieved some publicity because she wore a big spider brooch and left the government with egg on its face over the prorogation of parliament. And we all smiled. But no one cared about the constitutional technicalities of the prorogation, an issue which affected, didn't affect anybody's lives. It wasn't like abortion, which is a serious matter, affecting the lives of many people. We don't attract attention because we don't decide great social issues. We are not politicized. We leave that to parliament. The other disadvantage of leaving judges to make law on social issues is that judges deal in broad principles. They don't go down into details. Now, take, for example, the United States court decided that it was unlawful for southern states to maintain racially segregated schools. Very good decision. They said it on the basis of the amendment which said everybody's entitled to the equal protection of the laws. It was a change which would otherwise have to have been made by constitutional amendment, and that was quite impossible. So it was a great advance in social justice. But there are other ways of segregating schools than by putting up notices saying whites only. What about if you have uh, 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 providing that children must go to local schools? And in de facto, localities are segregated according to race. The answer the Supreme Court gave was that the federal, the federal judges should arrange for children to be put on buses from one locality and taken to school in another locality. Well, it, if, if nothing else could be done, it was a worthy effort. But to have judges supervise putting children on buses seems a very strange use of, judicial, of the, the judicial power. And the same is true of other aspects of, of equality. So uh, you really have to only consider, the, for example, the broad, shed, broad provisions of the American Constitution saying equal protection of the law. And so compare that with our own Equality Act, which has got uh, 218 sections and 28 schedules dealing in detail with what, what must be done in order to preserve equality. So to sum up, judges uh, have provi to have judges provide uh, inventive solutions to political social problems is a last ditch measure which a society should tolerate only if there's no acceptable democratic solution. It creates huge constitutional problems. Now, if you're an American, I can understand why you might be tempted to vote for this motion. Uh, but if you have a reasonably functioning democracy as we have, It's far better to allow political controversies to be settled by political means, by negotiation, compromise, and democratic vote in Parliament. And that's why I urge you to vote for the motion.